I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to our first Real Conversation of 2023. I wanted to lead off with who I thought was, if I were to give out an MVP, we give out hockey pucks at the Hedge Eye annual uh, holiday party, but if I were to give a, a market MVP, who came out first with like the most emphatic, oh my God, this is going to be bad bear call, it was the one and only Mike Taylor at the Hedge Eye Live event in May, I believe it was in the first week of May, and uh, while I believe he was wearing a different jacket, although a very nice jacket, he pulled out a piece of toilet paper and rolled it right onto the stage and went through a list of shoes to drop. Um, so, Mike, congratulations on that epic call. It was awesome, man. Thank you. Well, there's still a whole lot of shoes that haven't dropped yet. Uh, but uh, crypto was one of them, as you know, FTX um, and, and so many others uh, are all coming about. Uh, the private equity things uh, you see in the problems with B REIT and the redemption cycle that's just starting. Uh, this is some of the mechanics that's uh, underneath the um, under the surface that most investors don't know about. Well, I want to so. I want to get into a couple of those big ones that you just mentioned because those ones, you know, I, I think it'd be hard uh, for people to make the argument that at least uh, Bankman Fraud's uh, shoes haven't dropped. He's not uh, not in the Bahamas at least, but we have. We B REIT, you know, they got they got some funding from uh, California yesterday, which was unbelievably high cost capital. Um, so I wanted to to know if you had any any thoughts on that one in particular. High cost for who? <laughs> <laughs> well, think of it like this. Think of it like this. You got it's like one one captain at the front of the Titanic calling the other captain who's in the engine room that's flooding, and he says. Hey, you have a bucket? And he's like, yeah, I got a bucket. Okay, let's share. And, <laughs> and that's, that's, that's really it. As soon as it happened, I, you know, I picked up the phone. I started calling my peeps. And I was like, who's bailing who out here? And, uh, and, and the problem with B-REIT, and, and for those of your listeners that don't know, B-REIT is the, like, the most pri uh, popular and gigantic uh, private wealth product that has been pitched through all the platforms and gotten a whole lot of uh, retail money in um, to, to invest in real estate and in the documents. And it was pitched to me, by the way. So, and this is one of the reasons why I, I have a brokerage account at many places is so I can hear about all these pitches. And it's been pitched to me for years. Uh, and, and if you read the fine print, it says, yes, your money's locked up. You have to put $200,000, $250,000 minimum in and your money's locked up for one year. It's returned 18% every year forever. And after one year, you can have full liquidity and access to your money. So it sounds like an absolutely great idea. Mm. And then about two years ago, I got a call from a broker and said, we have news for you. <laughs> we have lowered the entry fee to $25,000 minimum. And is so you get in and you and I know when that happens for uh, these private wealth products that are illiquid and really for only accredited investors, twenty five thousand dollar minimum is like scrape. You're, you're literally it's a bar that's out of Schlitz. OK, the party is over. And and I was I it just, every bell went off and I and then I was thinking about when does this blow up and I think we even we talked about this at the beginning of the year this specific product that would the gates will go up and everyone will be freaked out about B -re. and then all the other private wealth products and if you don't know and I know you do but the uh, your your listeners may not know uh, that the other big products have been uh, private wealth in the way of leveraged loans. And leveraged loans right now have about a 10% yield. And it's a really great uh, return for um, people seeking dividend uh, income. Uh, the problem is with leveraged loans is that they've been sold to in these packages, uh, unsophisticated investors. And with leveraged loans, unlike other debt, there's no recourse. You are literally the last guy holding the cup when they go under. So if you think about the housing crisis that happened in 08, and this is another shoe that's going to drop, in my view. Um, the housing crisis in 08, you still had 70% loan to value, 60% loan to value, meaning you didn't lose everything. You had, a, you had collateral in the house. And these leveraged loan products, your collateral is zero. There's no recourse. You are last in line. You're going to get nothing. 
And so when these start to go, and I believe that will be starting in this spring, it's just zero, 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 and you can't get out. Yeah, you have and, and I've been, so I'm the, sorry. The, no, finish, go ahead. And I've been surprised uh, how well they've held up, but uh, meaning that nobody's forward looking, but the truth of the matter is, nobody's forward looking. And uh, the crises uh, only happen to these investors when a brick hits them in the face. Mm -hmm. uh, it be, and that'll be jobless claims, that'll be, and, and so what I believe the brick to the face is, is a, starting this quarter, and it might be just in the next few weeks, we're gonna start to see a cascading of uh, gates going up across these products. Uh, I talked to a number of brokers um, that have informed me on the DL that there is a, already a backlog to get out of these things, which means the gates are going to go up soon because uh, the backlog from last quarter gets applied to this. And it's really a collateral run on the money. Uh, people need the money. They need the money in part because uh, the hedging requirements for other loan vehicles are not allowed to include hedge funds on one end or some of these products. They thought you had liquidity, now they don't. So they're going to change their um, they're going to change their sort of rules on what collateral is. And this happened in 2009. I think it's going to happen again because they remember what happened in 09 and yeah. 08. It's it's an amazing thing because you know the the poorest of people or the people who had no money or, or could afford to lose all that they had left the least got absolutely pounded in the bullshit, you know, the crypto component of it or the story stock Tesla component of it. You, know, you could see that they're concentric circles. Uh, many of those people all own both, you know, whether it was Tesla yes. stock, meme stocks, et cetera. But now we're moving towards the other, you know, the other side of the pool, which is where the adults and the wealthy are. So, you know, whether it's, you know, high net worth products that you cited, unlevered loans, private equity, venture capital, you know, is it correct to just say that, we're just waiting, like you said, for the redemptions, for people to take their marks. And that's, that's got really, you know, it, it actually, for, I mean, if you just look classically at any recession, you know, profits go negative year over year, you know, liquidity dries up, people have to throw up their gates, redemptions are there, and voila. I mean, that, that, this is exactly what happens. The credit component of the event happens precisely at this time in the next one to three months. I mean, it's, this to me, is almost too easy to see. Am I saying that correctly uh, relative to, to what you're what you're thinking? Well, I get a, a lot of calls from my guys. In fact, guys that I've trained and are running funds now, and they're PMs elsewhere, uh, and, and wonderful, brightest guys. Uh, they're, they're astonishing. Uh, my group of guys that I talk to on a daily basis, and uh, what they don't, you know, they don't quite understand is that I have to have my money back component. And, and that's something that I'm working with them through right now on what that looks like. And it's a run on collateral. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we've seen it, though, in other areas that equity people haven't seen, meaning stocks to your viewers. Uh, we've seen it in the carry trade uh, all over the country, all over the world, where the, the one of the worst performing uh, assets was uh, U.S. Treasuries, mm -hmm. as we saw a uh, collateral issue where they were heavily levered up and not hedged uh, long, and they basically had a margin call on their borrowing and had to sell Treasuries, and that's been a gigantic component of the sell-off. It's something that I didn't quite understand until it was probably June of last year. Mm -hmm. Oh, Happy New Year, by the way. And to you. My man, the um, the redemption side, like we can talk about, you know, either the private side or the one that you have the most. Well, actually, you have familiarity with both. Mike Mike uh, speaks to a lot of people and really digs into these things. Um, but you know, you you speak explicitly to some of the most plugged in fund of funds, you know, allocators. You know, this redemption cycle from, you know, my former life as a hedge fund manager and yours. You know, where are we there? And if you want to use innings or however you want to describe it, we're in the first inning. That's We're in the good. first inning um, because, uh, and I know what the bet is. The bet is, is that the Fed's going to pivot and everything will be fine. And we need to go into that because I have great, great fear that the Fed is going to pivot too soon and have disastrous consequences over the long term, even intermediate term. Uh, so, but... Anyway, we're in the first uh, inning of that, and the redemptions just started in last quarter. And uh, my fund of funds guys were surprised uh, by the degree. And who? Uh, one thing that they cited was we're having redemptions from hedge funds because pension funds have to get out 
because they have to raise capital because they're having what's called a capital call on their privates. And, and that was a big red flag. They're like, uh-oh. And for those of you that don't know, sometimes when these pension funds and other investors will sign on for a private equity fund, they sign an agreement for a call on capital in addition to what they uh, put in and at some time in the future. And they receive that capital call because a lot of these privates are uh, circling the toilet bowl and they need cash and they can get it by doing this capital call through the private equity um, administrators. Uh, but they didn't have the money. The pension funds didn't have the money. And so they had to go find collateral to lever up and they couldn't do it in treasuries because treasuries sold off so much that they were underweight treasuries. So they had to go to hedge funds and, and, and equities in general. And that was one of the big reasons we saw a lot of the sell off, uh, especially in the 4Q. Uh, so it's really fascinating. And that's why I'm like, this is the first inning, because remember, the, the private books mark what the value is. It's pretty much whatever the hell they say. And this is a big reason why B Read is trying to raise enough capital so that they don't have to mark down too many assets on redemption. Because B Read, for instance, in my view, it, it, the the Blackstone real estate product is mismarked their NAV, the net asset value, by at least 20%. In fact, last year, they were marking a NAV that's up year on year, while all the assets have gone down double digits in the real world. And so they've mismarked it. And if they ever had to make a sale, the auditors would come in and say, no, 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 you got to you got to remark everything down. And then everyone will get their statement and it says you lost 16% this quarter. And then they freak out and they all want their money back. And, and that's what we're we're, we're engaging in right now, illiquid assets where everyone's jammed up to their eyeballs in it, and they're trying to scamper around and get enough money to mark the asset up uh, on the next raise because they all need money. And and this, this, of course, is the game that they're going to play. This is exactly what's done before. Uh, when in doubt, you have to mark your book up with your own money. So you have to find a source of capital, and that capital has been stocks, some treasuries, uh, things like that. But that's the first inning. And it, you could look at it like this, it's buying the dip because the market is a very small dip and now I got to mark it up to stay there. So I'm buying the dip. And what happens that's really bad, like what you watched in Tesla, is uh, levered uh, what is now kind of illiquid um, assets and people buy the dip, they get there and, and then it breaks to a new low. Yep. Well, and that is, now uh, what? That and is now uh, what? The, the definition of uh, shoes dropping going to shoes crashing when you make lower yes. lows and you're, you continue to make lower highs on the bounce you make lower lows on the on the preceding move i mean intraday as, as you well know yesterday intraday tesla was down 15 percent on the day uh, it lost more market cap in the first three hours of trading in a year ever for anything um obviously we've seen commensurate uh, and and really that's that that that's there's a there's a capital call on Elon Musk. I mean there's there's it's all to me like within the construct of what what I call the mother of all bubbles. It's all one and the same thing, Mike. I guess what people at least I talk to on the institutional side, clients that you know they're your friends or they're in your your team of guys as you call them um, or otherwise. I mean people it's it's just it's it's crazy because uh, it's 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 not my first rodeo, you know, calling a big crash or anything like that, or now talking to other people on the other side, what they want is what they're not going to get until it's too late. They all want to know what's the next, and I'm sure you're going to, by the way, you're going to have some ideas on this. So, so there will be some things that you think you know, but everyone needs to know. So what's it going to be this time? What's it going to be this time? Meanwhile, you got everything staring you right in the face uh, from, you know, crypto to, to, to be written back again. And, and I wonder if it's just not the same lesson that we all learned in 08. People first sell what they can, not what they should. And the last part of the movie is you have to sell what you should have. And that's all the illiquid shit that you haven't taken your marks on yet. I mean, Jonathan Gray at Blackstone, um, you know, I said shame on him. I mean, they're, you know, they're good people and all that. You know, they've run a great firm. But I, I thought that there was some shame in him. He was really talking up the nav of the product. He knows damn well he shouldn't have been doing that. Um, so we, we do have, like, some things out there in the public that are trying to keep, you know, the, the ball uh, or the shoes <laughs> from not dropping. Um, but that's, that's kind of anti-gravity type shit. Well, on the anti-gravity, uh, you know, I talked to my guys and they're like, well, Mike, why are you so sure that this has to happen? 
And and this is one of the things that I look at over time. I learned um, that great shoes to drop are things that have to happen. And so it's not really a question whether it will. When you look at this um, margin call in illiquid levered loan assets, um, and, and, and I really view this BREIT as a levered loan asset uh, in a way um, because it's it's sort of the wrong people in a liquid asset and they think it's liquid. Um, it's it's because of M2. And I think uh, your firm, uh, Hedgeye, has astutely put out some of the uh, commentary on the M2. And for those that you don't know, that's that's referred to as the money supply. And the money supply has exploded during COVID um, to the degree that the U.S. could be viewed as a banana republic. It literally lifted 40% plus in a period of 18 months. Uh, a 6% increase in M2 would be a lot. That means a lot of new loans, a lot of new money being created. And 40 plus percent is insane. Uh, but look, the, the Fed at the time didn't know how bad COVID was going to be. And, and you know, so they, they really panicked and, and hit that button and were in the back end of that modern monetary theory experiment where they're trying to pull the liquidity out. So M2 has is negative and it's meaningfully negative. And what that means, if you think about it, start with $100. So I, I run a business and I borrowed $100 into existence in the past two years, all right? And I need to pay a coupon on that $100. But the problem is right now, as of right now, it's like there's $99 in the entire economy available versus 100 before. And so there isn't enough money to actually make the coupon payment. So think of it like that. The money has been sucked out of the system. So somebody has to fail. And the most likely place where the failure begins is in these uh, low collateral, no collateral leveraged loan market and illiquid things. And this has to happen because there literally isn't enough money in the world. Believe it or not, there isn't enough money in the world to satisfy how much debt there is in the world. And you've also put up the chart many times on the uh, debt to GDP, which has gone parabolic in the past 10 years. And I mean, insane parabolic. Same with uh, home value to GDP. Uh, and basically every metric shows parabolic debt versus income. Yeah, if you, uh, and if that's you what we're just... that's what we're stepping into. These companies have to fail, and, and the failure begets failure, especially for these no collateral situations. And so I'm very, very, very worried about this, and I believe that we're going to start to see the beginnings of this uh, this quarter. Yeah, if you look at uh, guys, if you can go to slide 97 in our current macro deck, just so that people can contextualize with a picture the words that just came out of. Mike's mouth. I mean, you know, it, it's it's an amazing thing. I mean, to to see that type of a chart on the one side for many years, call it our entire career. You and I have been doing this for uh, collectively over fifty years, dare I uh, admit. Um, but <laughs> the, the, for our whole career, Mike, that chart go up. You know, when there's a problem, that chart go up. The money supply comes in. This is the whole point that you're making that. You know, everyone you know in our business is begging perpetually for the pivot. They're doing it again today. They're hoping that the Fed mints are more dovish or something like this. Um, but the fact of the matter is that QT is not dovish, and raising rates again in February is not dovish. And M2 going negative in rate of change terms, it, actually, it's the worst it's ever been. And, and if you broaden that to the to the chart on the on the right side, which is the G4, it's 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 much worse <laughs> you know, from a much and, higher. And you have to juxtapose this too, because it's that M2 goes negative. But at the moment where debt to GDP is parabolic. Yes. And and I look at it and I say, oh, my God, bad things have to happen. Big shoe. Bad things have to happen. And the bulls will say, well, that's good because the Fed will never let it happen. And yeah, well, that leads me into my biggest fear. Well, I mean, let's and, let's let's go. Th let's let, let's actually show that that charge just so that people can see. Uh, and by the way, we didn't prep this. I want your viewers to know you just pulled this all up 
we, Keith and I did not prep this at all. We don't even know what we're going to talk about. And he's <laughs> able to love these charts this fast. It's just goddamn impressive. Well, well, I mean, if you look at it on the household side, you know, like, because there's both, you know, our business, the, you know, corporate side, fully loaded, private equity, you can, public markets. But on the household side, on slide 30, you know, this is the only time in the history of the household side where we've shot towards a 7% mortgage rate and certainly not seen anything remotely close to that, to that pace. And when you kind of think this through and you think about the total debt that Mike's talking about on slide 34, you know, this is the world being entrenched in this short dollar position. So on the left side, Mike, as you pointed out, total U.S. debt, this is domestic non-financial sector um, debt in billions of dollars. So that would equate to $68 trillion. And then on the right side, you know, you get the EM debt and the, uh, the total foreign denominated debt. So these are like, like this has to happen. And, 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 and like you said, and I want to get into what you've also said has to happen, because one of your biggest shorts has been Apple, which is the most liquid thing on the earth that you could trade, and has also gone straight down. What's interesting is the Apple and the Tesla, which trade like water, go straight down because they need to be the liquidity, like you said, with your analog to the, let's just share the bucket, to go deal with this sucker. I mean, this, this thing is, there, is there any way it doesn't go that way that you're talking? I, I, what are the ways? It, it's the Fed well, comes in and goes dovish and prints money again, I guess is answer number one, two, and three. That, that, is, the, that is the only way this doesn't happen. And, and and I have a great, tremendous fear that the Fed will blink. And don't worry, I'll make a lot of money on it, right? If they blink and stocks take off, um, that they will blink. And how they'll blink, uh, I think everyone's wrong. Everyone cites interest rates. They won't. They will taper the quantitative tightening first. That'll be the first thing that they do. Mm -hmm. And then everyone will say, oh, pivot. But uh, on CNBC, people don't understand what that means. So they just keep talking about interest rates. Interest rates are, yes, it's a big problem, but the big, big problem is quantitative tightening mm -hmm. uh, for, for the cost of capital. Uh, so I, my biggest fear is that they, they do pivot too soon. Uh, they, they really, in order to make sure that inflation is down and stays down, uh, they have to pivot when jobless rates are at least 5.5% uh, unemployment. And historically, that's what we, where we need to be. And it's very important for your listeners to understand why. Why is it that they have to get to a jobless rate of five and a half? Because uh, they always tell you our job is to tame inflation, have maximum employment. That's not their job. They lie to you. They all lie to you. Their job is to make the Treasury look solvent. And we have a huge problem at the federal budget right now. The Treasury, which is what manages all the debt, the Treasury is now borrowing most of their debt over 4% up from 1.6. The vast majority of the US, and I mean vast, vast majority of US debt is on a ninja loan uh, at a teaser rate of 1.6 to 1.7. And, and that's literally how the government is financed or was financed on the short end of the yield curve. So it's essentially a floating uh, mortgage. And, and rates have gone because of their own doing, uh, rates have gone from uh, 1.6, 1.7 to over four. Uh, so that means that as they roll this debt uh, every year, the, uh, the treasury payout goes up. In fact, it is doubled. And well, who cares? It doubled. What does that mean? Well, in the, the tax returns, which the money comes out of, and you look at the federal budget, 15% or so of the uh, federal budget is coupons for the debt. Well, if you double that, all of a sudden it's 30%. Well, if it's 30% of tax returns that they have to pay out, that means you can't have a military. That means you can't have social security. You can't have Medicare. And the argument will be, well, they'll just borrow more. No, they won't. No, they won't. Because 40% of our debt is financed by foreign investors. So if they have to go out there and soak the market for more and more debt, our yields are gonna go up, up, up. And if you ride this out for three years, with a 4% yield, you essentially have succeeded in nearly doubling the cost of capital for the entire federal government. So we'll be in that situation. And this is why the Fed has to tank this economy in order to get yields down and make them stay down. And that's my view on it. 
And I hope that they understand it because I hope they do it. Because if they don't do it and they pivot too soon, inflation is going to come raging right back in 24. And there's structural issues around that, around minerals, materials, uh, labor, things like that. And I, I think that they're cognizant of this, and that's why they won't pivot, even if we have the beginnings of a credit crisis, which I believe we will, uh, starting in this quarter. It's, and it'll be early, meaning everyone will deny it, just like, uh, just like in uh, high-risk mortgages. They denied it for years before it really blow up. This will be faster. It's so uh, well because put. there's no collateral for a lot of the debt out there. That's why it'll be faster. I mean, Mike, you're doing people, the people uh, service by explaining what's going on in English. You know, wouldn't it be nice if, if, if there were other places where you heard people speak in English and in practical terms and how you're going to risk manage it? Um, you know, back to that point, I mean, that's... I'm terrified. I'm terrified that they will make the wrong decision. Terrified. Right. Not for me. I'll make a lot of money doing it, all right? If they do it, I'll know what to do. I'm terrified for my son and my daughter. Yeah, yeah that, well, that's, it will that's be, where I was going to get on this. If they I mean, get in that situation, we may be looking at the U.S. engaging in yield curve control, just like what this will be exactly what happened in Japan, where they can't stop printing. Mm -hmm. They have to manually push down the yield because they can't tank the economy because the duress that would come from it, because the debts are so high, it would be far too much to bear. And so then if they do yield curve control, the U.S. dollar is absolute toast absolute mm -hmm. toast because now we would be the u.s would be no better than japan and europe and china where they just balloon their debt with the printing press and and if you turn us into the going from the least dirty shirt in the basket to an equally dirty shirt in the basket they're not going to prefer the u.s dollar they're going to prefer nothing and and in order for our military to work in order for our cost of capital to work we need a uh, dollar supreme, dollar supremacy. And the only way we can do it is being more fiscally responsible than everyone else. And I hope that the, tr the Fed is cognizant of that because I really fear for decades lost uh, for the foreseeable future if that sort of transpires. And that is why ultimately I believe they will not pivot. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled. It's gonna be a very, very, very big deal on what they do if they pivot around credit issues and fear around the middle of the year. I think it'll be too soon. I think it has to be at the end of the year at best and into 24 alternatively. And that would really set us up for uh, a very difficult time with debt. Uh, that doesn't mean that there won't be money to be made and it's the worst thing in the world. Uh, I believe actually for the setup for this year is that stock picking is gonna be king. I believe we're going to have really, really great stock picking this year. Well, it's, um, it's a really kind of a humbling thing to hear you say that about your, about your son. I know uh, I don't know him well personally, but I know of him uh, directly through all your experiences that you have with him and Max and his, and his uh, what is becoming quite an illustrious uh, racing career at a, at a young age. So I know when you say that, I know you, you mean that in a way that, It'd be nice, like back to the Jonathan Gray point, he's just pumping the, the nav on B-REIT. You know, he's not talking about the long-term effects of what, you know, another Fed pivot would do for the country. That's what I'd love to hear. You know, I mean, they're really, to me, there are two kinds of fears, you know, on this topic. One very short term, the one that's existential for every single fucking guy that runs a book. Every guy that I talk to, and they're mostly guys. And there are many guys and gals, but... They live in perpetual short-term fear of any hint of what they've had, which is that thing that Mike fears on a much longer-term duration for the country. Those are two different fears. I rarely have conversations with institutional clients where they talk about the existential fear of the U.S. dollar, of capitalism, of free markets, of doing this again and again and again. It's like, it's like you know, you don't, you don't need a miracle. Yeah, actually, this has happened before, and that's, let's just tie this back a bit. If you listen to what Volcker actually says, whether it be privately or even publicly, publicly is very clear. People just don't want to listen because they can't afford the truth. It's like watching A Few Good Men. You know, he, he, he sits there and he says, I don't want to make the one mistake that Volcker made, because if you remember, Volcker didn't go hawkish enough early enough, and when he says that if he could take it back, he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have had, he didn't really have a pivot, so to speak, but he would have been more hawkish sooner because he had to finish the job 
at a much more forceful level of interest rates into 1981-82. So you do have the political setup for that, Mike. Like, I don't know if you saw, but DeSantis gave his first kind of like, you know, you know, his first stump speech last night. And, um, yeah, it's kind of the speech, really. I mean, and, and, you know, Powell's a Republican, and he says he wants to be like 1980s-style guy. And, you know, DeSantis keeps citing, you know, that his hair might be the same as, you know, the other Republican Reagan guy. And you know, it's not, it, anytime I mention that long-term case to the hyperventilating types that live in fear of the short-term pivot, like today, they're like, oh, I didn't think about that. But, but well, how do we trade today? You know, like, <laughs> it's, it's an amazing dichotomy, really, you know, at this point in American history. Well, I mean, in my experience, every great trade is at least a year in the making. And you have to look out to the if-then scenarios so you know what to do when the time comes. And so I spent an awful lot of time drawing on a napkin uh, how <laughs> things play out. Like like my, oh, wrong hand. <laughs> like my list of uh, over here, I'm over my left shoulder. Everyone asks, I have a list of uh, bearish trades uh, right here. And uh, many of them are ones that I think are going to visit uh, Dr. Zero. He'll be making a house call. Um, it's a, it, so you really think about uh, if-then scenarios on everything. And that's really how I play the game. So I'll think about the short-term, medium, and long. And long's always hard to predict. And I rarely bet on the long, but I know, or I'll try to train myself what to do when those sort of long-term events start to come into view. Yeah, that ticker list, I see a few, uh, few uh, little flashy ones that we like. Uh, I, well, we've already talked about BX, which is Blackstone. Uh, which you have on that list. You do have MPW on that list, which is a, oh, yeah. a, a really nice short. Um, yeah. What do you think prevents, it's one thing for Blackstone to, to, to prevent gravity for another month or two with the deal that they just did at 11.5%, at but um, what does an MPW do? Like, pick any of your shorts. Let's start going through some stocks where, you know, visiting Dr. Zero is a credit event. I mean, last I well, checked, what happened at, at MPW, as you know, our analyst knows it well, uh, it was a default. You know, it's, you know, they could call it whatever they want, but it was a default. It, it, it still might be. But, uh, I mean, look, that that one's more, you know, I I, I actually view that one more as a, an ongoing, dare I say it, potential fraud um, uh, that's going on. And I I don't want to go into too much detail about, about all the ins and outs on it. As you know, I, I do research on an awful lot of stocks, but that is definitely a distressed asset. But what I wanted to make clear to everyone uh, is that this year is the biggest number of publicly traded stocks I have ever seen that will probably go to zero. And I have a whole book of uh, names that I think uh, literally don't have the capital or the wherewithal to raise uh, between here and your end. And I, it's the musical chairs, and we go back to the M2, is that there's going to have to be a number of losers. And look, over the past decade, we've had an incredible number of businesses that have gotten very large market caps, uh, all dependent upon funding. And, uh, and, and many of them now have matured into businesses that are now productive, they're making a product, and they're making it at a loss, and a loss that's forever. And you, know, you can cite AMC or... Um, or DraftKings, uh, a whole lot of ones. Um, and uh, those two, I don't have positions in right now. Uh, but those are examples of ones that have to, in my view, probably have to skirt with zero or go to zero uh, because they, their underlying business is not a profitable one. And they're contingent upon constantly raising capital. Um, and really the, the, the investor, thesis, at least in the case of AMC, GameStop, Bed Bath & Beyond, is that, oh, hedge funds will get squeezed on it, so let's get long. <laughs> and I mean, that's the dumbest thesis. I mean, tell me what instance in, the, in which that thesis can persist for any period of time that's substantial. Never, well, ever. Well, well that, that, like, let's just, you know, tie this back to those two fears, you know, and, and you know, for, for everyone who is, is, is still human here, you know, you're constantly fighting these two wolves. I didn't make this up. Again, and, and, and your goal is, is not to let one of them win. And, and that short-term fear, Mike, that when I talk to, in particular, people 
at, at your former firm or any of the big pod shops, because they're trying to run neutral, which is extremely difficult, as you well know, in this environment. They, if you watch the rallies, you could see it again today, every single rally we've had to lower highs has been led by the shit, right? So these bear shit baskets, or a bit today it's the Bitcoin sensitive baskets, um, you, they, that's, that's the point. People are like, okay, we might have a dovish catalyst here with Fed minutes. Uh, I got to cover my shorts. And they do it all at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and it draws in that, that poor bastard who's sitting there trading meme stocks still at this point for what well, maybe he dipped into his grandpa's account at this point because he's eviscerated so much of his parents or his capital. Um, but but that, isn't that just it? That the, the most logical things to actually go to zero are the things that are up the most today or in, on any bear market rally day? Uh, yeah, usually, um, I mean, look, this has been a unique environment coming into 22, where there were so many businesses like this that were contingent upon constantly raising dollars for an unprofitable business that exactly. really had no horizon to ever be profitable. This is a unique time. And I know many of the younger investors, they don't know that because this is all that they know. But 20 years ago, this happened. It just happened on a much, much, much smaller scale. And I'm talking about the dot-com bubble. It was tiny compared to what has happened over the past year and a half. I mean, we just had so many 10 to $50 billion companies that just didn't and don't, still don't have a prayer of ever being profitable. And now that they are having difficulty raising money to keep this going, these many of these are down 80%. And, and like, for instance, if you look back at the biggest uh, market bubble PM that there was at the time, 20 years ago, it was Bill Miller. Mm -hmm. And and you remember Bill Miller. You know, he was the dot-com cowboy. And he got absolutely destroyed. And his fund was down 90% uh, by 03. And they shut the fund down. And that's it. And so I had it in the back of my head that 90% is sort of the bottom for the bubble, the bubble PM. The, the drawdown will be 90% top to bottom. And I look at uh, ARC uh, right now, and I look at the portfolio of names in it, and I'm not so sure the bottom's down 90% because 80% of that entire book, I, I don't think any of them make it. So the the low might be quite a bit more and it's going to be contingent upon what the fed does and when they do it because changing the cost of capital will change the direction of these stocks and the ability for these company to raise money and go back to their old game yeah so well, that's that's the part that people miss about store uh, well about the quads you know a bull market a raging bull market if you go back to you know, go to slide uh, 13 the history of the gdp series i mean we went to north of 12 percent gdp when quad two was peaking money was free uh, we had QE plus, you know, big government stimulus. And that's when you could sell the dream on a story stock. Let me tell you a story about the future. And that, you know, the future is great. But in capital market terms, or if you're poor me who started my firm in 08, I couldn't call and I didn't call. I, I had to fund my own business. And if we didn't generate a positive P&L within the, you know, the time frame that I had, three years, we would have gone away, like many startups do, or, or any growth opportunities do. And that's like, it's, it's a really amazing lesson that, that people have to learn cyclically over and over and over again. I mean, this is the third time for you and I, because, you know, we got through the 01 recession. You should barely see the recession, but the profit recession was a collapse. And, and obviously anything that was unprofitable went away. Uh, then you had 08 and then obviously you have now. But now it's much larger. Uh, what I'm most concerned about, just to tie this back to the dollar discussion and rate policy. If you go to slide 52, guys, to show, you know, what Mike and I are talking about here. You know, this Volcker moment for the U.S. dollar in the early 1980s, you, you go back to this point where that first move up in the dollar actually went to where we've gone the last two, you go to the 2001 recession or most recently. You know, but if somebody's for real, like after the 2001 recession, you had Greenspan do exactly what Bernanke eventually did. They, they went to the pivot. They went to the rate cut. They went to the cowbell. If you don't have that, if the cost of capital is rising, and the value of dollars explodes from here to the upside like it did coming out of the 81, 82 recession. Mike, there is nobody on the planet that runs money inside of the last 25 years, the time that I just spanned, that would know what to do from 1980 to 1983. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't disagree. <laughs> so, so that's my question for you. I mean, it, well, it, it is our greatest fear. It's the greatest fear for my short book. But I know what to yeah. do with it. I know what the sound of cowbell is. I have yes. cowbell. I have a Missy. I have a Mississippi State cowbell. I have uh, this. I have a little cowbell. I have. I got all sort. I know what to do with cowbell. Like I'm not. We're not idiots. We've been trained. You know, if it yes. rings a, softly. We cover a little bit. If it rains loudly, we don't just cover. We get long. We get long, Kathy Wood. Yes. That's how you make money on that. Absolutely. But, but the fear, just because it's a fear doesn't mean it's going to happen. In my situation, my high probability situation is that everyone's greatest fear is going to end up not happening. I, I, have, I have fears that are very, very similar. So, <laughs> and, uh, and it is... It is uh, yeah, look, the job that we do is, hell, I don't even know why I do it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you know, I, I, sometimes I think, just like, just like my son uh, racing cars, I'm like, couldn't you have done anything else, <laughs> right? So <laughs> anything. I look at myself, too. Couldn't I have? Because I, it would have been a lot easier, and I'd probably make more money if I did. Not that I haven't done well. You know, I've done all right. But, uh, but there are many, but what I really love about it is the cerebral challenge and uh, running the pink fund um, and, and doing this, uh, working with my friends. I love being wrong because I'm wrong every day. It's just how wrong am I <laughs> and can I still make money anyway? And that's always the battle between being right and making money. And uh, that I, I enjoy that battle because it's, uh, I don't know because I'm sadistic. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of like the, the the latest line of question I get from hedge fund guys because they're all looking for because the CPI cowbell thing didn't work out. Now it's got to be the labor market. So they're like today in my inbox, it's like, did you see Salesforce? That's got to mean it could, it could be Salesforce has like seventy five thousand or eighty thousand employees. You fire ten percent of it, you know the numbers like eight to ten thousand people. You know, just take ten McDonald's, ten stores, not like. You know, 10 billion in market cap. Take 10 stores and you have more employees essentially than that. So, you know, the, the labor market, we keep telling people, is, is a gigantic pyramid. Uh, you live at the top of the pyramid if you're having a conversation with me and you run money. And, and the, so do the people at Salesforce. At the bottom of the pyramid, I mean, these jolts, these jobs opening numbers are huge today. And, and there's no relief in wage, in, in the most recent wage inflation. So that's been my latest pushback because their latest, you know, worries about the fears has to do with, you know, the labor market getting worse at a faster rate, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have any uh, quick thoughts on that? Because I want to get into some of your single side. Well, I do because it actually plays into like w one of the ideas I have for the year, because I always think about things that have to happen. And one thing that has to happen is that the no matter what, the uh, Fed has to get the short end of the yield curve down to two. And they're going to drill the economy to do so. And that is, you know, the pain that uh, that has been exacted in, through quantitative tightening and negative M2 and the short end of the yield curve being, which will probably be 525 or 550 uh, percent. Uh, what that means is we're going to get, we're going to have probably a meaningful credit problem and recession. And so, what works then? Well, what's going to happen is that the two-year the yield on the two year is going to go from 4.7 to two or lower. And over what time does that have to happen? Well, between now and a year from now. So I now have a one year trade long the uh, two year. And since the two year is yielding, you know, four and a half percent, you can actually use that percent coupon to cheaply lever it up and run levered long the two-year in size. And I think that that will probably be the two-year and three-year treasury are going to be some of the best performing uh, assets uh, between now and year end. Hmm. And, yeah. and really, it's I look at it and I say, well, how do I lose money on this? OK, inflation just explodes higher. And I have no idea how that happens now because I look at rents. I'm involved with rents. I look at car prices. I look at energy prices. I look at uh, even the cadence and wages, which is uh, you know slowing. 
but you kind of add it all together and versus the comps that we just experienced and net net i think that especially when the credit starts to roll uh with this continued pressure on credit uh, i have no idea how we don't have a meaningful collapse in inflation uh throughout this year and with that uh we'll be portending towards a recession and future rate uh, reductions. And so the two-year is going to drop with it, meaning the interest rates will drop, but the two-year value will explode. And so I am set up in a levered, long two-year position right now. And I'm there because I really don't know what the downside is. I don't see, I could be, I might, honestly, I might be a month early, all right? But that's okay. I, when I see it, I'm not going to get the top. I'm not going to get the bottom. I just have to be there in pretty good size for the middle. So I'm there in about half position, and I'm waiting and watching, and that's it. And we'll have a moment. And when that moment happens, I think it's going to happen pretty quick. Yeah, I would say that your downside is I use my wrist range to answer that question. I don't use my you know, sure. Anything I haven't even that. looked at it. Um, yeah. So you'd, you'd have in the very immediate term, you'd have you know five basis points of upside material, which is nothing for you. Um, but, you know, like I'd be expecting that to make a big lower high versus where that peaked in early November up near 475. So that, that'd be your ultimate downside in the bonds is, you know, so that's very interesting. And, and that's what you should look for asymmetrically against. And, and you always tell me this because Mike and I talk a lot and he'll, he's, he's like, he, he goes really short and he goes really long. Uh, he's been, he was really short last year. I, as many people know, I maxed myself at minus 25% at short, so I'm kind of like a wussy compared to Mike, and admittedly so. Um, but he does look, he, once he gets that short, you, you tend to look for some asymmetric long so that you don't stay that short. And I think that that's a very thoughtful you know, way to do it. How about on the short side of stocks? Like, I don't know if you want to rank them one, two, three, or, you know, in terms of ideas. Um, well, it's actually, I, believe it or not, I have some long ideas. Okay. Uh, I have my long ideas because uh, a number of names at the end of the year got absolutely tanked on uh, tax loss selling. And mm -hmm. so there's a handful uh, that are really unique in having uh, transformative events or sort of long term themes that th this is what I look for is things that sort of have to play out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'd like to bring up um, a little company called Freyer, and I'm long this name, F-R-E-Y. It's a... It's a battery company, yep. and and it's a 1.1 billion market cap, uh, and it's small. And I don't always dabble in small stuff, but I'm going to give you guys like relatively small stuff. And these are things that I think are multi multi baggers. And that's so if I'm going to buy something small, that is what I'm looking at. And uh, and Freyer is going to be delivering batteries. Uh, they building a plant, going to be delivering batteries for sale in uh, 2Q, and they're building out plants in Europe and the U.S. And they have a, a great battery technology. It's not a risky battery technology. It's validated. And uh, what is different about them is that they are able to uh, produce at a much lower cost than others, uh, materially lower cost. Uh, and, and that's the unique feature. And so they're going to be able to deliver a profit margin that is meaningful in a space of exploding battery usage. Uh, and I don't just mean cars. It's everything everything uh and and in fact they're not even angling entirely for uh automobiles it will be in automobiles it's just not exclusively that so the company right now at one billion dollar market cap 1.1 has a five billion dollar backlog and as soon as they start delivering in 2q and and by the way you have real players in here like the Koch brothers are involved uh meaningfully involved especially with the u.s footprint uh that this backlog is going to go from five billion to twenty-five billion dollars because there is nowhere near enough capacity for the next ten years. So these guys are going to be able to lock up super deals on twenty-five billion dollars of backlog, and then it's just going to go from there as they build out the footprint. Uh, so at a billion-dollar market cap, I, with all of this. Uh, starting plants, announcing uh, off-take agreements, and on and on and on, you're going to be able to build a model that shows we're going to be making over a billion dollars in EBITDA really soon. Uh, and this thing should be trading like it's comps at 14 times EBITDA. So 
so this is you know going from 1.1 billion to 15 billion market cap and then more so uh, this is just and and now it's gotten cut in half at the uh, tax loss selling period I, i'm like this is an incredible moment to get in and this is around the area that i did get in around seven or eight because i i pitched it earlier last year and uh and so i'm i'm actually much larger now than i was then uh because it's such a compelling argument uh and remember even in bad markets there are stocks that do well really compelling execution in a crappy environment gets bought it gets paid for and this i believe is one of those names the other one i believe is uh pct which is uh pure cycle therapeutics or uh technologies and uh pct i've owned for a while it's very similar story to frayer except they're making plastic rather than uh making batteries and uh, it it's it's positioned as a um as a plastic recycler where they make polypropylene and their plant is going on the first plant is going on imminently so it goes from a, a kind of a concept story uh into an execution story much like Fryer, uh, which has an incredible amount of value in it billion dollar market cap uh, but what's really interesting about pct uh, is that they're really a plastics manufacturer instead of a recycler and if you look at the attributes of this they're able to recycle polypropylene into a virgin like um, polypropylene, which is pure, and it can be used in a zillion of things from food packaging to automobiles. Um, but they're able to make this product for less than a petroleum company can make polypropylene. Their margins on this are higher. And not only that, their pricing is higher. The demand is completely inelastic because everyone gets to put on their packaging recycled plastic mm -hmm. and that's incredibly strong powerful marketing and of course the carbon footprint element to it and not only that in europe which they will be expanding to uh this coming uh, this year in 23 in europe there's a, a 40 some odd cent tax per pound on this plastic and there's no recycling of it so these guys are going to be able to take that tax stick it into the price and it goes right to the bottom line um, on the first plant, they already have well over a decade of backlog. Every plant that they build, and they're in the process of building a giant plant while they're finishing off the small plant, which is their starter plant, uh, and that'll be done in 24, uh, expect them to have many, many, many plants uh, doing this exact same thing, building a moat. And they have a technology that, with IP that nobody else can do, and that's why nobody's ever done it. So you basically have pricing power, a monopoly, a white space and inelastic demand. And we're on the cusp of that execution right here. So this is another one that I bought a lot of. And it is like most small caps, it's down. Uh, but I have hedges to offset that. And I think that that will work because uh, I see a long-term white space here where there just aren't enough competitors and there's uh, meaningful demand, a lot like Freyer. And then lastly, I'll bring up one called MP. The ticker is Michael Peter. And uh, MP is uh, also aligned with the auto business and the shift to EV. It's a $4.2 billion market cap and it's trading at 20 times forward. And they are the only US miner and processor of rare earths. And if you just take a gander of how many EVs have to be made worldwide, and there are so few rare earths players. And I bring this up because it's also dropped about 40% in the last couple of months on tax loss selling. This is going to be over the next future years, this is going to be a huge home run. I mean, we have a vertically integrated uh, US where the US policymakers are intent on securing our own uh, rare earths. This is the only player to do it. Its cost of capital is going to be greatly reduced through government intervention and assistance. And that's the same for Freyer and probably the same for PCT, where they're going to be able to get loans with government subsidies for doing all their things. So I like MP, Freyer, and PCT. Well, I think that these are multi-baggers. Uh, and I think that PCT and Freyer are probably multi-baggers over the next uh, 12 months. Well, you have, uh, you have just successfully and professionally and masterfully, really, because not many people can do what he just did, which is uh, synthesize 
three ideas like that in a very short window of time and get you to the point. That's it's, it's a high level skill in this game. You know, to get it right from there uh, is entirely another. But um, you just covered the entire Q and A, by the way, on on all three of those. <laughs> Because, and it's interesting, you know, like, you know, because the audiences have been trained by other platforms. You know, the platform that was Rear Vision to pitch Luna or, you know, CNBC's, you know, perpetually pitching stocks. So people, they're still in that thing. You know, like, I'm, I am a little surprised that there, there aren't uh, any questions that aren't being voted up that have to do with these shoes to drop. I mean, we get that you you, you care about uh, the stock picks, and, and 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 Mike just literally circled the entire Q and A on that. So so well, thank I'm you. Actually, for I, I did have a short. I did have a short. And okay, well, we got up, four it, minutes well, left. Well, it Let's blew up today. It blew up. I have a whole bunch of shorts, but it blew up today, and I wanted to talk about it. Uh, it's a Novix. Oh, really? Enbx. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and I know you had a guest earlier who's very bullish on this uh, battery producer, and I researched all the battery producers. And, uh, and I didn't understand what they were talking about being bullish Novix because I did the work on it, and I, and with some assistance from uh, tech people that I talked to, and, and we came to the conclusion that they can't make this battery. They can't make it with any scale. And the fail rate, the yields, as you would call it, is extremely high. Ooh. And I didn't understand. Well, then what happened was the CEO quit on December 29th. And I wanted to come on here and say, hey, whoever this new guy is, he's going to have to come clean. And I just didn't know that it would be literally four days later. And here we are, I came clean and the stock's going <laughs> to you know, cut in half. And because they don't, they can't make this bad. It's a great idea, but it's a concept company that they can't make it. And I want your listeners to know that I spend a lot of time figuring out frauds that can't work in many, many spaces, not just healthcare. Uh, as you know, I'm a healthcare analyst or PM, um, but but I spend a time on frauds. And and uh, honestly, I've, I've probably made one third of my entire career on shorts. And uh, and on frauds, uh, and I suppose I'm just one of the guys that doesn't talk about it a lot, or advertise it, or promote it. I'm um, just quietly been doing this. It's more loud now, um, and I just find stuff all the time. Like we talked a little while ago, it was earlier on about Sam Adams, and I went on your program and I said I talked to distributors that have a thousand days of inventory on the shelf, thousand days in distribution. This is insane. Uh, and you saw what happened to Sam Adams. It's just just doing the work and plowing through it and finding things where management is just lying horrifically. Yeah, and you know, this is like a, maybe a point to finish on here uh, because it's it's one thing for me to be critical and say, hey, look, you got to get rid of your old wall baggage. You got to stop watching whatever you're watching just looking for a pick. A, a pick is not a portfolio. So if you have ENVX and Sam Sammy Adams on the short side, against PCT. PCT has traded in like a range that would be defined as watching paint dry for the last couple months. It's doing nothing. Nothingness is somethingness if you have two shorts against that long. So just using a very basic example that would be inside your book. Now Mike has, and both Mike and I, run many more positions inside of the book. So I would encourage you, and, and, and I'm just kind of like, I'm just trying to get Mike people to be less, you know, oh, I got this pick because I got it from Mike. And just think about, like, he has, look behind him. He just said that there are more shorts that are going to go to zero than any time he's set, seen in his career. So By his, a mile. And so his By longs are non-zeros, and there's a long short book there. And um, maybe just to finish on that, portfolio positioning right now, if you don't mind, can you give people an update how you're set up? I am set up pretty neutral, and I've been neutral, and I got uh, December wrong. I, I did not expect that degree of selling to happen. Mm -hmm. I really did not. Uh, I will submit, because we talked about Tesla, I've covered 90% uh, of my position uh, out of spite, and I wasn't big enough. I actually had covered a bunch of it um, uh, once it had dropped 25% uh, at the 1,000-day moving average. That would be the 200-week. Um, and and I, I just did not. I, I did not anticipate the flush uh, like I've seen it. And, and we have to remember in this market that has been 
that no longer has market makers in it, things that go up go parabolic and don't stop, and things that go down do the same too. Because when things move, there's nobody on the other side to make right. a market. It's all in the in the, what we call the pipes. And uh, that's hedge fund terms for a machine. It's in the pipes. So nobody sees it. Nobody knows who. There's no matchmaking done. There's no block orders anymore saying we're having a liquidated book here. I'll buy that book, whatever, and I'll pay. I'll give you give me a 3% discount on the book, and then I'll leak it out over the next month, and I'll book a 1% gain. I, they don't do that anymore. So the movements that we see are violent. Mm -hmm. Which makes, I mean, which is back to one of the many... Uh, excellent coaching points and you know, professional teaching points that you made, which is this year should be very good for long short stock picking. Again, after a, an absolute you know, level of carnage and collapse, and many, many stocks that are down 70, 80, 100, almost some will be down 100% or go to zero, uh, that's what happens, right? You're, the shorts that work start to go down less because they actually become longs. And the, and the longs that held up, which is exactly what happened yesterday, the, the Goldman basket of 12-month winners was down 2.8%, Mike, on the day with spies down 40 basis points. That tells you yes. all you need to know. I mean, it's, um, so it's a very interesting and exciting time for, for somebody like you that's, that's had such a good run. And I'm so happy for you because you're such a good guy and you've, you're really like you're putting yourself out there because you want to help people. And that's like a, there's, a, there's a noble cause to that. There's a huge teaching and component, teaching and, and educational component to that, and I think we, you know, if there were Mike Taylors in the world, we would find them. Um, you know, but there aren't that many that are willing to to do what he does when he comes on Hedge Eye TV and do it with with courage and and conviction, and also just 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 be an all around good person in this business. And we need more of that. So I just wanted to, to thank you for spending time with us. Well, I'd like you to do a private call with my wife because she's <laughs> told me many times that one Mike Taylor is enough. So, <laughs> if I'll, you might. I, uh, I'll, I'll pass on doing that call with her, but I may do, uh, <laughs> I may do a conference call with Max if he, uh, yeah, maybe we'll bring him on, on Hedge Eye TV to explain uh, you know, his next victory if he gets it. Uh, yeah, well, we're in store. We're racing Indy. Uh, this year, Indy Junior Cars, and uh, and we're still doing the National Karting Tour uh, for his uh, second year, and uh, went really well. He finished uh, P2 in the U.S., and uh, he just did a, a global event, an international event, where he finished P3. And I was like, that's a second place and third place. And for a rookie year, that's, damn, he has the gene, dude. I don't know what to do about it, but it's going to cost a hell of a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> so. That that's uh, so you better just keep making money as you like to say. Yeah, and, you and, know and it, you can you know fund it. it. <laughs> so well, thanks thanks again, Mike. Appreciate having Keith, you. Best of luck to everyone this year. Thank you. He is the one and only Mike Taylor. I mean, come on, you got to follow the guy again. Get involved. He'll he'll reply to you. By the way, on Twitter, he's got a lot of knowledge to give. Uh, the the world needs more pros pros like him. Thanks for joining us.